Hi, all. I always hate to shut down nope. our engagement and conversation, but I want to make certain our speaker has enough time to share her insights with all of you. And thank you for joining us today. I'm Kate Cagney, the director of the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. So glad you could join us for today's lecture. I want to give special thanks to Ken Coleman and to his colleagues at the Center for Political Studies for conceiving of this event, All Eyes Are event for us today. The University of Michigan hosts a wide range of events honoring the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. From mid-January to mid-February, you've probably been participating in a lot of those events. Today's event is ISR's contribution to this broader program. The theme of the university symposium this year is the revolution of MLK from segregation to elevation, which explores King's activism after 1964 and highlighting the evolution of King's focus on segregation to a broader more radical and revolutionary platform that includes health, economics, and education. So today's talk speaks to that theme, of course, and I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Elizabeth Hinton. Professor Hinton completed her PhD in United States history from Columbia University in 2013. She's an associate professor in the Department of History and the Department of African American Studies with a secondary appointment as professor of law at Yale Law School. Before joining the Yale faculty, I'm going to emphasize this role. <laughs> she spent two years as a postdoctoral scholar in the Michigan Society of Fellows and assistant professor in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies at the University of Michigan. Her research focuses on the persistence of poverty, racial inequality, and urban violence in the 20th century United States. She is considered one of the nation's foremost experts on criminalization and policing. Among her other works, I'm just going to highlight some briefly here, she has two very well-received books that gain wide attention. The first, From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, The Making of Mass Incarceration in America, examines the implementation of federal law enforcement programs beginning in the mid-1960s that transformed domestic social policies and laid the groundwork for the expansion of the US prison system. Then her 2021 book, America on Fire, The Untold History of Police Violence, and Black Rebellion since the 1960s probes questions similar to those in her talk today. So let me tell you a little bit about today. Professor Hinton will take us on a journey through history from Detroit in 1967 and Miami in 1980 to LA in 1992 and beyond to chart the persistence of structural racism and one of its primary consequences, the so-called urban riot. Professor Hinton will challenge the optimistic story of the post Jim Crow U.S. and present a new framework for understanding our nation's enduring racial strife. So before we welcome um, Professor Hinton, I just want to say a few things um, about our interaction today. So though many are joining us on Zoom, at least 80, I believe, since I left, 100 on Zoom. So we have a very broad crowd today. Please note we're providing live captioning of this event, and you can view those captions by turning on the closed captioning feature on your screen. So we want to make sure those on Zoom know that. Also, we'll have a Q&A at the end of our presentation, and we just um, we just engaged in a short conversation over here and, and uh, decided that we should go until 1.20 today because we have so many of us in the room, so many questions. Um, and Professor Hinton has so much to share with us about her recent work. And so we realize some people might have to depart at one o'clock, but, um, but let's celebrate and stay a bit longer. Uh, and we'll also be having, of course, Q&A, and we'll walk around with Mike. I'm gonna be managing that piece. So with that, um, Professor Hinton, we're so glad to have you join us today and tell us about your work. Thank you. much, Katie, for that uh, generous introduction, and to Ken Coleman for uh, inviting me to come and speak as part of the MLK festivities um, here. And of course, thank all of you for coming. And those of you who are tuning in on Zoom, I don't know where the camera is, but um, I'm just really honored that um, you're here and engaging my work. And um, as Katie mentioned, this is kind of, this is a very special opportunity for me because not only did I do my postdoc here, um, but I also grew up in Ann Arbor, and it's just wonderful to see people like uh, Professor Ren Farley uh, joining us today. Um, I have to say, Ren's known me since I was like a little, little baby, so I'm a little nervous to be speaking in front of him. But it's also full circle because uh, the, the, the archive, the research that I did um, 
what I'm, what I'm about to talk to you about all took place in this room um, in Christian Davenport's uh, office. And so I owe um, a great deal to Christian. This wouldn't be possible without him, without the center. So it's just exciting for me to be back and to be talking about this work um, and the place where it all started. I think also, especially with, um, with AP African American history coming under attack and with people increasingly questioning uh, whether this history has educational value, having these conversations and talking about these issues, especially kind of in the context of, of King, um, feels more important than ever. And this panic around so-called critical race theory fits this larger historical pattern. And that is that every time people mobilize for racial and economic justice, the forces of white supremacy mobilize to repress those movements. And so I guess that cycle is what I want to talk to you um, about today with, the, with respect to the history of police violence and Black rebellion. Now, the fear that Black people might rise up in violence has been widespread among white Americans for centuries. Indeed, um, it's been one of the central problems of American history. Slave owners were terrified that their human property would defend themselves by running away or that groups of enslaved Africans would take bloody revenge on their white masters. So in addition to the law enforcement bodies that settlers organized in New England and the early police forces that emerged in St. Louis and other frontier cities to monitor indigenous people, slave patrols, which were America's systems, the first real organized systems of law enforcement were charged with uh, uh, suppressing potential slave insurrection by raiding slave dwellings, by dispersing gatherings, and by um, patrolling areas around plantations and towns as seen in this image. And these essential duties became the, the kind of foundational logics of American policing, and that's maintaining the social order through the surveillance and social control of people of color. Under the terms of the Declaration of Independence, enslaved Africans were justified in rebelling against the forces that kept them in bondage. The contradiction between the American founding values of liberty and equality and the governing principles of racism and exploitation sustained the conditions that bred rebellion in early America and in contemporary America. Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration and owner of more than 600 slaves in his lifetime, embodied this contradiction better than any other. As he wrote of rebellion in 1781's notes in the state of Virginia, and I'm just going to read the last lines, which are kind of the most famous ones. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever, that considering numbers, nature, and natural means only, a revolution of the wheel of fortune, an exchange of situation is among possible events. Jefferson went, off, went on to observe in this off-sided passage that the exchange of situation was on the horizon, that the slaves were rising from the dust, and he hoped that their total emancipation would be realized, quote, with, con with the consent of the masters rather than by their extirpation. Eventually, Jefferson knew the violence of racial oppression would come back to haunt the nation that was built upon that oppression, and he hoped that when it did, the ruling elite would fix the contradictions that had cursed America from the very beginning. A democracy based on the principles of freedom and equality, sustained entirely by the enslavement of millions of people and the displacement and genocide of indigenous people. Jefferson argued that to ignore this paradox would bring peril in the future. So Jefferson cast Black Rebellion as a self-fulfilling prophecy that he and other founders had set in motion, a menace that would remain as long as racial hierarchies were preserved and state-sanctioned violence mobilized to preserve them. Paraphrasing Jefferson some 180 years later, President Lyndon Johnson remarked of the 137 rebellions that followed the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., quote, what did you expect? I don't know why we're so surprised. When you put your foot on a man's neck and hold him down for 300 years, and then you let him up, what's he going to do? He's going to knock your block off. So despite their awareness of and even sympathy for the causes of rebellion, neither Jefferson nor Johnson, limited by their own racism, were willing to write the, the nation or willing to lead the nation in writing the wrongs of history. And they left it to the future generations. And by doing so, ensured that inequality and violence would continue to tarnish American life. President Johnson would confront the greatest moment of sustained domestic violence since the Civil War. 
Every major urban center burned between 1964 and 1972, but the problem was not uh, just uh, in places and archetypal ghettos like Harlem and Watts and in majority black cities like Detroit and Washington DC. It could happen in any place where black residents were denied access to political and economic resources and lived in segregated unequal conditions. Together, these events caused hundreds of millions of dollars of property damage and shaped the lives of the store owners who found their businesses destroyed, the parents who lost their teenage son to riot police, the firefighters and the cops who were harmed and killed, and millions of other Americans in between. And we've been living in the aftershocks of this period since. Now, through the rhetoric of our politicians, media coverage, and much of the academic literature on the subject, we've become accustomed to refer to these events from Harlem in 64 to Minneapolis in 2020 as riots, or what those left of center sometimes refer to as civil disorders. We're then left to view these moments in a historical vacuum as riots, as something meaningless or irrational, <laughs> devoid of any political motivation and ultimately criminal. This is the position from which the Trump administration responded to the violence of 2020, which I'll talk about in a bit, and how President Johnson responded from its inception, even as he recognized that American racism had placed black people in a chokehold for 300 years. Johnson announced following the release of an FBI report on the violence that swept eight cities during the summer of 1964, quote, the riots as well as other criminal and juvenile delinquency problems in our cities are closely connected. Each riot began with a single incident and was aggravated by hoodlums and habitual lawbreakers. Johnson dismissed the possibility that these hoodlums may have shared the same grievances as civil rights protesters. Three years later, Johnson would tell the nation during a televised address delivered in the middle of the unprecedented violence in Detroit in 1967, quote, there is no American right to loot stores or to burn buildings or to fire rifles from rooftops. That is crime. Now, before this point, riots in the United States had mostly been carried out by white vigilante mobs who were hostile to integration and who took justice into their own hands, often with the support of local police. A riotous lynch mob as large as 5,000 descended on the black community of Springfield, Illinois in August 1908, randomly destroying black businesses, driving black families from their homes and executing two black men. Mobs in East St. Louis in 1917 made black wartime factory workers and their families choose between being burned alive and shot to death, among other acts of terrorism, in one of the bloodiest riots of the 20th century. And this white supremacist violence only escalated as black migrants continued to flee the terror of the segregationist South in greater numbers during and after World War I, searching for better opportunities and safety from the white mob. 25 cities erupted during the red summer of 1919 when white and black residents fought and killed each other on the streets of Chicago and Washington, DC. In the rural community of Phillips County, Arkansas, where black tenant sharecroppers were attempting to unionize, white supremacists killed at least 200 black people. Two years later and roughly a century ago, another 200 would be killed in Tulsa, Oklahoma in what is known as the Greenwood Massacre carried out by 2000 white men who were deputized fully authorized by the county government to commit various atrocities against black residents. And this white supremacist violence continues to, to pervade American society, indeed fully revealed itself once again on January 6th, uh, 2021. Although in the post-war period, local police came to assume many of the previous functions of the white mob. So when white people no longer appeared to be the driving force behind rioting in the nation's cities and black collective violence against exploitative and exclusionary institutions surfaced, rioting became associated with criminality and grounded the intensifying clamor for law and order. In the view of President Johnson and others, rioting and crime were two strains of the same disease in black communities that could only be cured by more police. As the McCone Commission determined in its report on the Watts uprising in Los Angeles in August 1965, quote, these riots were each a symptom of a, a sickness in the center of our cities. And the commission identified the cause of this sickness, not as structural racism, but as disintegrating black families who set in motion a spiral of failure for their children, leading them to a life of crime and welfare dependency. <laughs> 
So it was the riffraff of the ghetto who fueled the violence, so the theory went. The criminals, the young, the unskilled, the jobless. They rioted, they burned and looted, seeking momentary thrills to break their tedious lives. Now, sympathetic liberals may have believed then and believe now that the anger and discontent behind the violence was legitimate. Yet, like the, the McCone Commission, they often concluded that the rioting was pathological impulse rooted in spontaneous, uncontrollable emotion. In this view, the riots were ultimately counterproductive. The violence only alienated allies and intensified anti-Black sentiment. Proponents of law and order from across the political spe spectrum in partial contrast, believe that riots should be seen as nothing other than events of mass criminality. So all of these understandings reinforce the general sense of disorder in urban centers and justified lawmakers' decision to enlist the police to manage that disorder. But a proper account of the violence in the post-civil rights era depends on our ability not to interpret it as a wave of criminality, but as a period of sustained insurgency, a rebellion against authority. The violence emerged in response to a moment of tangibly felt racism, a single incident, as Johnson said, most often touched off by a police encounter. But the tens of thousands of Black Americans who participated in this collective violence were rebelling against past harms, past wrongs, and the systems that preserved unequal conditions over generations. Unlike the Black Panthers, the Black Liberation Army, or other revolutionary groups active during these years, these instinctive community-based rebellions sought concessions from authority in the areas of employment, housing, education, and law enforcement, and a reordering of the status quo so that Black people would no longer be treated as second-class citizens in their cities and in the country. And these were the same goals as the civil rights movement more broadly. The violence served as a message to the nation that civil rights reform and unprecedented war on poverty and nonviolent direct action tactics were inadequate to solve the problem of racial inequality. Something else was needed. Johnson himself recognized in the same July 1967 speech on Detroit where he linked writing with crime and disentangled it from civil rights protests that, quote, the only genuine long range solution for what has happened lies in an attack mounted at every level upon the conditions that breed despair and violence. So the president's rhetoric indicated that he favored social programs, but in practice, he increasingly looked to law enforcement as a short term solution to, man to manage the manifestation of those conditions as they appeared through rioting and crime. Other liberals joined Johnson in this shift during the second half of the 1960s as the rebellions increased in intensity alongside the rollout of civil rights legis legislation and new job training, remedial education, and community action programs under the war on poverty. Even sympathetic uh, liberal officials wondered if perhaps the social welfare programs and the egalitarian transformations of the 1960s had gone too far. Viewed as riots, as criminal acts that could only be controlled by more police, Johnson and other authorities never seriously questioned the way the war on crime, launched one year after the war on poverty, may have also <laughs> been culpable for the violence. Instead, they embraced the expansion of American law enforcement as the best strategy to handle race relations moving forward. Now, the decision to respond to the rebellions with police force was not a foregone conclusion. Johnson's own advisory commission on civil disorders, known popularly as the Kerner Commission, offered a promising but unpursued alternative to the escalation of policing and incarceration. In its final report of February 1968, which went on to become um, a national bestseller, I think selling some 2 million copies as a mass market paperback, the commission famously observed that the United States was moving towards two, two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal, and offered policy options to confront the problem of racial discrimination and inequality. So basically, the commission warned federal policymakers and the nation that the war on poverty was not enough. It recommended the creation of 2 million jobs for low-income Americans, continued federal intervention to ensure school desegregation, year-round schooling for low-income young people, the construction of hundreds of thousands of public housing units, and a guaranteed minimum income. Absent this massive infusion of public resources, promoting greater access to political and economic institutions, quote, sufficient to make a dramatic visible impact on life in the urban ghetto, a rising proportion of Negroes in disadvantaged city areas might come to look on the deprivation and segregation they suffer 
as proper justification to engage in large scale violence followed by white retaliation in the words of the Kerner Commission. So this grim forecast about continued violence came to fruition immediately and continues to shape American life. Federal policymakers did not heed the warnings of the Kerner Commission or take seriously what residents told elected officials, newspaper reporters, and researchers about how the fires could be prevented in the future. Nor did authorities take the persistence of rebellion as an indication that the strategy of increasing state surveillance and militarizing crime control forces in black communities, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, had inflamed the violence that officials wanted to prevent. But the Johnson administration blamed the riots on black men between the ages of 15 and 24 and developed a new national law enforcement program to target that demographic. When faced with alternatives, lawmakers pursued, pursued a punitive path that advanced racial injustice. Now the rebellions appeared most threatening in the summer of 1967, then the aftermath of Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination in April, 1968. And our memory of these incidents largely stops there, but the rebellions endured for years to come. In fact, and these figures um, come from Christian Davenport's work uh, on the quantitative side on this based on the Lemberg archives that's housed at the Radical Information Project. Between May 1968 and December 1972, at least 960 segregated black communities across the United States witnessed 1,949 separate uprisings, the vast majority in mid-sized and smaller cities that journalists and scholars tend to overlook. Through these four years, nearly 40,000 people were arrested, more than 10,000 were injured, and at least 220 people died. Now, even less recognized than this wave of Black rebellion are the Puerto Rican and Mexican Americans who similarly took up violence in an effort to secure equal rights, improve unequal conditions, and challenge the emerging crime control apparatus. At least 200 rebellions were carried by Latinx residents after King's murder, the majority of them in Puerto Rican communities in the Northeast. There were 21 such uprisings in New Jersey alone, but also in a number of Mexican American communities in the West as in Albuquerque in 1971. Although many state and local officials joined national policymakers in primarily targeting young black men for new punitive programs after 1965, Latinx communities increasingly suffered from levels of police brutality and shared the conditions of mass unemployment, degraded housing, and unequal access to educational resources. So along with black rebellions, these events should be recognized as part of a much larger political impulse arising from <coughs> shared grievances among people of color and drawing our attention to the inherent discrimination within American law enforcement and the criminal legal system. Now, most of the violent encounters involving black and brown residents during this period emerged in response to the policing of ordinary everyday activity. They happened when police broke up community gatherings or when police intervened in matters, in matters that could be resolved internally, like disputes among friends and family. They happened when police enforced laws that would almost <laughs> never be applied in white neighborhoods, like gathering in groups of a certain size or acting like a suspicious person. And likewise, they happened when police failed to extend to residents of color the same courtesies they afforded to white people, like allowing white teenagers to drink in a park and arresting Mexican-American teens for the same behavior, just how that rebellion in Albuquerque started. If they would just leave us alone, there would be no trouble, said a young black teenage boy who threw rocks in Decatur, Illinois during an uprising in August 1969. His solution was a straightforward reaction to an obvious issue. Rebellion was always possible when ordinary life was policed, and often the mere sight of police who could potentially arrest, beat, or even kill you was enough to prompt a violent response. Multiple occasions of seemingly arbitrary or an unnecessarily aggressive police force accumulated into frustration and set off preemptive violent reactions. So this is what I call the cycle, the recurring pattern of over-policing and rebellion of police violence and community violence that helped define life in segregated low-income communities of color in the late 60s and early 1970s. And it is especially in secondary cities like Decatur that the war on crime unfolded in its most lasting and influential ways, helping entrench racial inequality and putting this nation on the path to mass incarceration. 
Now it's significant that this rock throwing, fire setting and window breaking that emerged in nearly a thousand black communities during this largely forgotten window occurred after Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination and after President Johnson signed the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act into law. Now Johnson had called for the war on crime in March 65, which began an unprecedented investment into local law enforcement that was prompted in large part by the threat of black rebellion. So as Americans fought the Vietnam War, federal policymakers ramped up police on the uh, operations on the home front to battle political radicalism and rebellion, creating a pipeline to deliver surplus army weapons and technologies to local law enforcement. And city officials took advantage of these new freshly available federal resources to control black neighborhoods. The federal allocation for police forces went from nothing in 1964, so before the war on crime had been declared, to $10 million in 1965, $20.6 million in 1966, $63 million in 1968, $100 million in 1969, and $300 million in 1970, a near 3,000% increase in five years. On the ground, this translated to programs that modernized police departments with riot control training and with military grade weapons like AR-15s and M4 car carbines, helicopters, steel helmets, three foot batons, masks, armored vehicles, two way radios, tear gas, and a handful of low cost police community relations initiatives thrown in for good measure. Although black communities had been vulnerable to targeted surveillance, frequent encounters with police, mass arrests, illegal searches, and outright brutality in the century after emancipation, the enactment of the Safe Streets Act meant that residents in segregated low-income neighborhoods in big cities like Detroit, mid-sized cities like Phoenix, and smaller cities like West Point, Georgia, would be patrolled by police departments with an arsenal of riot control equipment at their disposal. By 1970, federal policymakers had allocated some $40 million, or about $300 million in today's dollars, on such equipment for local law enforcement. And at the same time, the Safe Streets Act, with, with its initial $330 million outlay for crime control, supported the influx of police into neighborhoods that seemed vulnerable to rebellion. So let me give you a particularly egregious example of how this um, cycle played out, one that I wasn't able to include in America on Fire. So this happens in St. Paul, Minnesota during Labor Day weekend in 1968, um, when mostly, uh, when hundreds of mostly black, young black people in their teens and early 20s gathered downtown at a community dance. And in this case, the preemptive application of force, tear gas was used on the part of police, brought what should have been a fun event to a violent end. So the young party goers you see in this image um, had ventured about two miles from the segregated Rondo community where they lived to STEM Hall, where local funk bands, the Exciters, and the Blazers were playing that Friday night. And in anticipation, uh, they had selected cute, freshly pre pressed outfits to wear, and they had done their hair. And some of them had probably hoped to dance with their crush, and some of them <coughs> probably hoped to get uh, past first base. <laughs> and at the time, uh, the conditions in the city's Rondo community, which was home to 85% of St. Paul's Black residents, clearly resembled that of Harlem, Watts, Detroit, and other low-income Black communities across the United States that had also erupted. And that is, St. Paul suffered from a severe low-income housing shortage that failed to provide people with standard, even decent living conditions, Black rates of unemployment at more than three times that of their white counterparts, and disparate numbers of Black families living below the poverty line. So the youths weren't there to protest these conditions by violent or nonviolent means, but simply to um, enjoy themselves and have a good time. So by 10, 10 p.m., a group of about 500 had arrived to hear the bands and move their bodies. And one group of friends, all young men, left the dance floor and headed to the bathroom in Stems Hall basement where they could kind of get away from everybody else for a little bit. Um, and two cops followed the group downstairs. The officers were white and they stood out and they were off duty and uh, not in uniform, but they, uh, they came to Stem Hall with their guns and with their radios just in case anything suspicious happened. So they had already anticipated that there would be an incident. And the, walk, the officers walk into the bathroom ready for trouble, just as one of the teens pulls a pistol from his jeans to show his friends. In no time, the officers move in to make an arrest, but they were easily outnumbered. And the young men began to yell in protest, hoping to prevent their friend from getting arrested. Um, 
The officers called for backup. They drew their guns to hold the teens off. There was some kind of scuffle. Um, and one of the officers ended up getting shot uh, in his shoulder. Reinforcements arrived at the scene around 10.30 p.m. So the party goers who were dancing upstairs had no idea uh, what was taking place below or that anything out of the ordinary was happening until tear gas suddenly came pouring into STEM Hall. It was difficult to see. People's eyes started to tear. Their nostrils burned. Their throats began, became clogged as if they were being choked. Their chest tightened. Um, but it was impossible for the young party goers to find relief because the police had locked his, had used their nightsticks to lock them in or trap them really in, in STEM Hall with the tear gas. Um, it was only after all the on-duty police in St. Paul arrived, about 150 officers in total, plus five reinforcements from Ramsey County, County Sheriff's Office, that the police opened some hall, and that's what you see in this image. So the youth, anxious and traumatized, poured into the streets to breathe in fresh air, and the first thing they saw was this fleet of law enforcement ready and waiting to make arrests or worse. The police instructed all attendees to disperse or go home, and most followed orders, but about 150 remained, which was a match for the police force. And for them, the night had ended much earlier than expected. They were just getting going, and their rides home had yet to show up. And many of them wondered where to go next or what to do. And many of them were angry, having just been violently tear gassed out of nowhere and for no apparent reason. So the decision on the part of St. Paul police to throw gas grenades at a grouping of residents created violence, even if, even if its purpose was to prevent it before it began. So some of the teens began hurling bricks, bottles, rocks, and even chairs at police outside some hall. They taunted them. The police then moved in to break up the, the crowd by force and the, the group, the, the young people quickly split up into two opposite directions. The police followed their lead. Um, as the teens made their way back to their small, often deteriorating homes, smashing the windows of white owned businesses, breaking into cars and stores, assaulting white civilians and pulling fire alarms along the way. Now, just three weeks before the incident at Sam Hall in Racine, Wisconsin, a fight between two attendees at a dance held at Washington Park High School led to police tear gassing a crowd of 250 black teenagers. The youth proceeded to move through the streets of the Black neighborhood in the south side of the city, smashing store windows, stoning cars, and setting fires, much like their counterparts did in St. Paul. In Harrisburg, the state capital of Pennsylvania, a peaceful protest against police brutality in June 1969 quickly turned into a rebellion lasting for several days after police angrily tear gassed a, a crowd. The violence only ended after a black high school student was shot and killed by a local policeman who claimed the teenager was preparing to ignite a Molotov cocktail. Black residents in St. Paul and in Racine and Harrisburg and in thousands of communities across the US were fighting back against more than just the police officers who interrupted them or brutalized them as they went about their lives. Although the tactics may have differed, the people who attacked police uh, smashed windows, set fires, and plundered local stores, again, shared many of the same demands of the civil rights movement, and that they were fighting against the process of their own criminalization, as well as making unanswered calls for socioeconomic inclusion and against racism more broadly. So in effect, by holding a group of young people from the Rondo community at gunpoint, unnecessarily tear gassing several hundred more and carting off <laughs> dozens of others to the city jail, the St. Paul police set the cycle in motion as the night went on, seriously injuring at least 30 black residents in the process. The incident in St. Paul and thousands of others in the immediate post-King era and beyond further demonstrates that aggressive policing tends to incite violence, especially when residents are protesting the very thing that they are then subjected to. The conditions that bred the police encounters and legal injustices that precipitated the rebellions of 50 years ago and in the 80s and 90s and today would not have happened and could have been avoided entirely had national policymakers and law enforcement authorities decided to respond in a different way to the enlightened protests of the post-civil rights era in both its nonviolent and violent forms. Now, prevailing interpretations view the rebellions as a break from the nonviolent direct action protest tactics of the civil rights movement. The second reconstruction, which sought to meet the unfulfilled promise of the civil war in its aftermath, aimed to integrate American society and extend the bounds of citizenship. It secured the right to an education, to shop at certain stores or even certain restaurants, and to vote. 
It made racism no longer acceptable in American public discourse and created a growing black middle class. But with the war on crime came new forms of social control and with them a new form of resistance. Indeed, Martin Luther King Jr.'s death and the collective sorrow, anger, and disillusionment that followed it marked a turning point for the mainstream civil rights movement and its emphasis on nonviolence, a strategy that had failed to protect its most visible proponent from the violent forces of racism and seemed to many incapable of securing true freedom for Black Americans. In the words of Black Panther uh, Party leader Eldridge Cleaver shortly after the assassination, mm -hmm. King's murder was a, quote, final repudiation by white America of any hope of reconciliation, of any hope of change by peaceful and nonviolent means. For Cleaver, the only way for black Americans to quote, get the things they have a right to and deserve is to meet fire with fire. As Cleaver and the rising generation saw it, the sit-ins, marches, boycotts, voter registration drives, and legal challenges that had defined Black politics in the post-war period had not addressed structural inequalities or provided protection from the lived realities of police and white supremacist violence. So the young people rebelling understood their predecessors to have failed. They looked back at the heyday of the civil rights movement, and they looked at the conditions they were currently living in at the end of the 1960s with police tear gassing them at a dance for no apparent reason, and they rebelled. And this was the most widely adopted form of protest among young black people from King's assassination through the early 1970s. Even if they did not participate and often served important roles in calming the violence, many older residents resonated with and admired the, the determination of those who stood up to the forces of anti-black racism with rocks and fire. As a black activist in Alexandria, Virginia put it, quote, the expression the youngsters put forth is a deep and hidden expression of older Blacks. Approaching adulthood and the era of Black power, young Black Americans were emboldened with a kind of courage to meet police violence with violence that perhaps the previous generation living under Jim Crow segregation could not have possessed. If government authorities were unwilling to protect Black residents from police brutality, then self-defense, a politics Black Americans had adopted historically under white terrorism and government compla complacency in an attempt to create safer conditions in their communities presented itself as a rational alternative. In addition to serving as a form of protection among the nation's most vulnerable, violence might force state, local, and national politicians to respond with greater urgency to Black residents' demands. As a spokesman for the Hartford Black Caucus declared in 1969, after Black residents engaged in confrontations with police and damaged nearly 100 buildings through the summer, quote, the power structure reacts to riots and violence. This is, the, this is Black people's only power. By their actions, those who participated in the rebellions argued that violence was a necessary strategy to secure economic access and full civic inclusion, not just for Black people, but for all Americans. Now it can be a struggle to imagine the young people who threw rocks at police or who looted local businesses or who defiantly walked through the rubble after a rebellion as political actors. And this bias has influenced the writing of history. Even scholars and activists interested in forms of resistance to systemic racism have been reluctant to take seriously the political nature of black rebellion. Yet just as much as nonviolent direct action, rebellion presented a way for people of color to express collective solidarity in the face of exploitation, political exclusion, and criminalization. And arguably, the success of the nonviolent direct political action that characterized the civil rights movement depended on the presence of violent direct political action. As Martin Luther King Jr. himself recognized, the power of mass nonviolence arose in part from its ability to suggest the coercive power of violent resistance should demands not be met. Therefore, when we reflect on Black protests, past, present, and future, we should endeavor to see both its violent and nonviolent expressions as entwined forces. And to do that, we should attempt to see violent rebellion on its own terms as a form of protest that has been just as integral to the history of the United States and freedom movements. Both violent and nonviolent traditions continue to ground movements for racial justice. The large scale rebellions of the last decades of the 20th and early 21st century, including Miami in 1980, Los Angeles in 1992, still the largest in American history, and Cincinnati in 2001, share many of the same causes and characteristics as the collective violence of the earlier period. 
But these rebellions and the political violence that followed beginning in the mid 2010s emerged in response to miscarriages of justice, like the acquittal of the four Los Angeles police officers who savagely beat Rod Rodney King in the first viral police brutality video and then were acquitted. And exceptional incidents of police brutality, like the fatal shooting of Michael Brown by Ferguson police eight days after he graduated high school. They emerge in response to the way policing measures advance an inherently racist criminal legal system that disproportionately ensnared millions of women and men of color, deepening segregation and inequality in the process. Taken together, the history of this violence demonstrates that patrolling low-income neighborhoods with outside forces does not effectively control crime. In fact, it establishes a dynamic where residents and officers view each other as the enemy, rendering both sides less safe. Had policymakers and officials at all levels of government taken the rebellions as an opportunity to seriously listen to residents' demands, contend with underlying socioeconomic causes that the Kerner Commission identified, and reconsider the purpose and function of police, the negative consequences of the punitive approach to urban problems might have been avoided entirely. The most important lesson from the rebellions that police violence precipitates community violence escapes policymakers and the scholars they consulted. Instead, led by the national government, authorities further criminalized entire communities where unrest materialized for the remainder of the 20th century and still today, allocating billions of taxpayer dollars into the wars on crime and drugs and gangs and mass incarceration that represent not only gross violations of civil liberties and human rights, but are arguably the biggest domestic policy failures in the history of the United States. People of color continue to be much more likely to suffer harm or death with police lingering in their community, either by each other or by an officer whose job is to ostensibly protect them. George Floyd and Breonna Taylor are legacies of this policy path sustained over five decades, and their murders, brutal displays of state-sanctioned violence, galvanized the largest mass mobilization in U.S. history during the summer of 2020, with millions of people protesting anti-Black racism and police violence in all 50 states and some 4,444 cities across the planet. When peaceful protests demanding justice for George Floyd in Minneapolis was met with tear gas and mass arrests on the part of the police, actions with, which effect, effectively set the cycle of police violence in motion, residents in turn responded to the buildup of unanswered grievances and the lack of concrete changes to their immediate living conditions by using the available resources at their disposal, as they had in the, early, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, as they did when they were tear gas at Sem Hall. They threw rocks, bricks, bottles, and firearms at buildings, police precincts, and police cruisers. And they took goods from major retailers such as Target and AutoZone, and then burned these and other institutions like this Arby's to the ground. Following the cycle, the police unleashed more tear gas and more pepper spray and more rubber bullets in response, and the National Guard was deployed there. In total that summer, despite the fact the vast majority, or about 96%, of the protests remained entirely peaceful. More than 17,000 National Guardsmen patrolled the protests in American cities in 23 states and Washington, DC. In addition to this deployment, the Trump administration sent federal troops to Chicago, DC, Portland, Seattle, Kansas City, Albuquerque, Cleveland, Detroit, and Milwaukee under Operation Legend and Operation Diligent Battle, Valor. Now, what's especially notable here is that the wave of protests in the summer of 2020 diverged in critical ways from the rebellions of the 1960s and 70s and from the massive conflagrations that came after from Miami to Cincinnati. Unlike most previous rebellions, which typically began with demonstrators throwing rocks, bottles, and other objects when police arrived to patrol their communities, the demonstrations from uh, Ferguson in 2014 onwards all began as peaceful marches and vigils in response to flagrant acts of police violence. When police responded aggressively to these nonviolent protesters, some of the demonstrations quickly turned violent. So although the nature of the historic demonstrations in 2020 resembled the civil rights marches of the first half of the 1960s more than the violent protests later in the decade, authorities frequently responded as they had in those later years, right? They fired pepper spray canisters, they beat protesters with riot sticks, they imposed curfew, made arrests, and in some places called in the National Guard and federal troops. 
So as in the 1960s and early 1970s, both the nonviolent and violent protests of 2020 have forced the question that has grown even more pressing about what kind of country the US should be. Will the nation continue along the undemocratic and misguided policy path that has criminalized people like Breonna Taylor for generations, or will America finally fulfill the unfinished promise of the abolition of slavery and Jim Crow by supporting the structural transformations and re redistributive changes at the national level that tens of millions of people demanded across the United States and the world during the summer of 2020? These are the problems that have been central to American history and why people took to the streets and cities burned once again three years ago. So here we are in the aftermath of, of these long COVID years and Jim uh, George Floyd, and we're still very much in the cycle. Um, less than a year after George Floyd's murder, um, Republican legislators in 20 states enacted anti-riot bills, as they are called, imposing new criminal penalties for protesting and making exercising one's First Amendment rights punishable by a prison sentence of between two and 20 years. In effect, conservative lawmakers responded to the tens of millions of people took to the streets during the summer of 2020 by emboldening law enforcement to crack down on those who might protest for racial justice in the future. Meanwhile, in the aftermath of calls to defund the police and invest in alternatives outside of law enforcement to prevent crime, the Biden administration and Congress have embraced policies to refund the police. When homicide surged in nearly every American city in 2020 at rates the nation had not seen since the mid-1990s, the enduring violence should have been taken as evidence that traditional public safety models have failed. Yet Pre President Biden offered a prevention strategy that used part of the $350 billion American Rescue Plan to hire even more police officers in Chicago, New York, and other cities that experienced alarming spikes in gun violence and pay their overtime. So federal stimulus money that was intended to address the severe impact of COVID-19 on public health and economic outcomes, outcomes of course, which affected black and brown people acutely is now being used to encourage states to expand resources for policing. As Biden said in his uh, 2022 uh, uh, State of the Union address, fund the police. So like the era of rebellion in the 60s and early 1970s, liberal and conservative policymakers today um, are championing law enforcement over supporting vital social programs in neighborhoods where schools are underfunded, where community centers and after school programs for children have long been closed, where public parks are not maintained, and where the water is not safe to drink. Disinvestments that, over generations, have made these same communities vulnerable to both community violence and police violence. That Republican lawmakers move quickly to limit constitutional protections for those who march for racial justice, while generally failing to hold those accountable um, who plundered the seat of the American legislative branch on January 6th, and in some cases explicitly defending their actions, indicates that many of those in power are willing to forfeit uh, American democracy to preserve longstanding racial hierarchies. The most effective approaches to crime prevention involve programs that respond to community needs and grant control of public safety to residents, especially in the areas where the state has failed. So new investments into preschool programs, job creation measures, mental health treatment, college scholarships, decent affordable housing, and reconstituting the criminal legal system based on the principle of repair instead of retribution would make for a safer society and a stronger democracy. Police are the default responses to violence and other crises in low-income neighborhoods of color, but community needs can and should be met by the people. In the era of civil rights and rebellion, sustained political action and sustained visibility force policymakers to listen. And in the wake of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor's murders, the resulting mass mobilization and surging white supremacy, some lawmakers and the public are listening again. The challenge of the 21st century is actually to bring about change. We as a nation still fail to reckon with the history of Black Rebellion and with the wisdom Martin Luther King Jr. prophetically offered toward the end of his life, one that recalls Thomas Jefferson's own warnings, that only, quote, social justice and progress are the absolute guarantors of riot prevention. There is no other answer. Constructive social change will bring certain tranquility. Evasions will merely encourage turmoil. More than a half century after King's insights and more than 200 years after Jefferson's, it is clear that America will continue to catch the fires of rebellion until the structures of inequality are finally dismantled and the police are no longer empowered by authorities to manage the material consequences of conditions that are beyond 
their control. Thank you. I, that I, I didn't uh, talk about Tyree Nichols in the talk, but um, obviously, and especially the last point I ended on, um, happy to open up conversation um, about that case as well. So we're moving to our Q&A portion and Anna will definitely yeah. take the microphone around. Hi, Dr. Hinson, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I really appreciated how you repositioned our understanding of violence and the role for racial justice over the course of US history. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to how, how we reconcile the importance um, that violence has played in the history for racial justice and, and its, you know, its legitimacy in the face of atrocious violence by the state and vigilante um, you know, with the moves that we're hearing about this week, um, such that the FBI um, was moving and placing mercenaries inside of Black Lives Matter to install and to perpetuate violence, right? In Denver, Colorado, we just learned about that this week. Um, Cointel Pro 2.0, they're calling it, right? And so how do we reconcile the fact that violence does play a legitimate role in this struggle while also knowing that the state in ways is, is entrapping people in taking these acts? Well, it's, I mean, of course, related to um, the monopoly that not only the state has on violence, but that white people um, have on violence. I mean, you know, thinking about the, the contrast between FBI in investigations, um, it, it's infuriating to me that the FBI also knew about the planned attack um, on the Capitol and didn't do anything to stop that. Um, we contrast that and the police response uh, to January 6th from, you know, the way that um, nonviolent tear uh, protesters were tear gassed in Lafayette Square in order to create the photo opportunity for Donald Trump during the summer of 2020, so like four months before, um, all of which is reflected in that. And, um, you know, that's actually like part of the, the, the lack of um, protection from both state sanctioned and, and, and white supremacist violence is, is what fuels the cycle and what um, you know, one of the, the things that I was trying to emphasize in the talk is how, you know, especially in the wake of King, um, self-defense becomes, so the, 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 the emphasis on nonviolent um, direct, direct action during the kind of classical phase or the earlier phase of the civil rights movement transitions to self-defense in the post-King moment, because logically, if you're under attack, um, and in some places, you know, in the book I read about um, this place called Carroll, Illinois, in York, Pennsylvania, some of the worst, um, most sustained and protracted incidents of rebellion occurred in cities where white supremacists and police forces were very much intertwined. So this self-defense becomes um, a, a kind of a rational political strategy if you have no recourse um, whatsoever from the state. So, you know, I think it's it's that it's it's trying to understand. Um, you know, or, or, or to take a step back to think what are, you know, why, why do people embrace these sets of strategies, whether it be self-defense or whether it be kind of offensive violence um, in response to a, a complete lack of, um, uh, of, of recourse or addressing these problems um, from the state. So I think the, you know, when it comes to the FBI's involvement in, in Black Lives Matter too, it's a legacy of, um, of Cointel Pro and the fact that, you know, any, any group that poses um, a, uh, a challenge to the racial status quo gets labeled as criminal. Um, so, you know, Black Lives Matter is criminal, the way that the media, I think in many ways, uh, portrayed the protests in 2020 were criminal, even though they were mostly nonviolent, but that's not what uh, the coverage really reflected. Um, and, and that kind of instant association between struggles for racial justice and criminality and police response is all kind of related to the same, um, the same, the same thing, the same set of problems that are at the center of, of this work of what I was talking about. I'll take the next one. <laughs> Since you mentioned the media, and it's actually 
thinking about this throughout the duration of your talk, that it's interesting to think about the changing structure of the media and how that might alter the way in which these incidents are reported. And if you could reflect on the role of social media and the way that information transmission is now speedier and how that can change some of these perceptions. Yeah, so I think, so just like the media in general, I mean, one of the, th I, I do think that um, the media has better tools to talk about and understand this violence. I do think that what we saw in 2020 was a little bit less um, sensational than a lot of the coverage um, uh, from the like late 60s and early 1970s. Part of the problem is that um, much of the coverage is um, is based entirely on uh, police accounts, police reports, and so it's necessarily uh, skewed. But the you know the the archive that I used um, for the book and for this talk, you know, is based entirely on. Um, news articles that the, the Lemberg Center had collected, which is essentially like a news clipping service to document conflict in American society. I was talking about this um, briefly with, with Vince earlier today. You know, I think um, social media and technology, right, the fact that we have cameras in our pockets now on our cell phones has changed everything. It has um, exposed the kind of brutality that's been happening um, for decades if not centuries, and made it kind of undeniable. Um, that coupled by the way that the, this information can be shared and that new organization can happen on social media, I think, you know, is a big part of the reason why, um, you know, from Michael Brown in, in Ferguson in 2014 onward, um, the Black Lives Matter as a concept, as a movement has been able to mobilize and move um, so many people. The, the kind of danger in social media though, so as you know, it, it's been crucial to um, spreading awareness about this issue as technology has been essential in terms of documenting um, police abuse. It also, um, you know, I, I, I think that there's a, it, it can prevent people from engaging in the kind of protest <laughs> that, is, that is gonna be necessary, that we know uh, from the history of movements for social justice that is necessary to bring about change. So I think, you know, there, there's a tendency, well, if I just like retweet this or if I, you know, make my profile black um, in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, that that's somehow enough. And it has to, you know, I think it, in some ways it handicaps people from getting off of their phones and their computers to writing to their elected officials, taking to the streets for a sustained period of time, engaging in political education with people, um, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. I owe it to you. It wouldn't be possible without you. So the, uh, the question kind of emerges for me is like, um, so we see this historical pattern of this um, repertoire and the persistent use of this particular repertoire. What we don't have an understanding of relative to the amount of information and the trajectory of scholarship on nonviolence is we don't have like the theoretical component that, that goes along with explaining what this particular tactic is supposed to achieve and how. And this has always been like a, a consistent kind of like attack on it. It's like, well, you know, um, it's the, this is what the voice of the voiceless do, but there's no clear articulation of this is the problem. This is what we see as the problem and this is how we're gonna resolve it. And so this has always been kind of like a fundamental problem with these forms of like resistance and rebellion, um, the, the lack of articulation. I mean, so, so uh, Jim Scott argues this is perhaps one of the, the clearest manifestations of kind of like, um, commonplace everyday resistance that people engage in. You don't need a special training for it. You don't need a particular uh, part of an organization. And so everyone can, can join. And so in, a, in many respects, it's the clearest articulation of kind of like the raw energy of there's something wrong. But moving from that to an articulated understanding of how to resolve the problem and all this other business, I'm curious um, what you think of this imbalance as it, mean, as, it, as it kind of like gives us information about Okay, we can go forward. People will do this. We'll, we will see more of it um, until the problem is addressed. But how does that connect to any body of growing knowledge or continued knowledge about how to kind of actually fix the problem? Mm -hmm. So I think that, that's a great question. And it is, you know, I, I see it as kind of asking, or it's two parts. You know, one is about the, the people who engage in these tactics themselves, where there's like, we don't have like manifestos or like a clearly articulated set of demands. And that's where, you know, um, 
and I'll you know talk a little bit about my methods and actually where you, you and, and the archive come come in and actually the conversation that uh, led to you giving me access to the archive, which is that you know we see these kind of like spatterings and as doing research for my first book, I saw that these rebellions were kind of like continuing into the 70s in ways that people hadn't talked about. Um, but I think that when you like the, the way that it's all put together and like the sheer the, the sheer number um, of, of rebellions, the fact that, you know, obviously they're all distinct, they're all different, they're all unique in each place, but the patterns that we see again and again. And, you know, speaking of news coverage, I was saying that a lot of it was, you know, most of it is from the perspective of police, but they're, you know, in the archive, there are, there there are these moments where journalists go and they try to find out what happened. They try to talk to people. And again, you know, uh, you know, during this period across city, um, in small rural places, it's the same, like people are saying, the young people who participate are saying the same thing. Actually, like, the thing that they say the most is we need jobs. You know, we want jobs, give us jobs. It's, it, give us jobs, um, give us black studies curriculum in our schools, give us places to play, the same thing over and over and over and over again. So I think that's why the, the, the Lemberg has been so important and, and actually em, emboldened me to make these art, to, to make this, this argument about the political um, dimensions of this violence. I think in terms of solutions, I mean, I think that we know what the, we know what the solutions are and actually the people that participated had the solution. They said, we need jobs. Give us jobs, invest in our communities. The Kerner Commission had the solutions. Um, and the Kerner Commission, of course, did a lot of surveys. They held hearings, they talked to people, and they said, okay, you know, like this is not about the police. This is about we need to invest different resources into communities. Um, you know, the, this this happens in communities that have been under resources, happens in communities, even, you know, um, in by the late 1960s, where war on poverty programs were already being disinvested from. Um, so I think the solutions are there, and I think that the people who participated, even though you know they didn't necessarily have a manifesto, also had the solution. Um, one of the other interesting thing, and this kind of gets to the question about uh, violent and nonviolent protests too, is that like the other part of the pattern is that every time rebellion did happen, or a lot of times that rebellion happened, um, you know, churches, established civil rights organization would organizations would use it as a as an opportunity because they had the ear of uh, the local government and in some cases the state government to advocate for all these things, to advocate for jobs, to advocate for recreational programs, to advocate for more investments into schools. Um, for residents, the rebellions were 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 you know about much more than just police. But the response on the part of authorities, you know, the Kerner Commission is kind of like a mini example for what we see playing out in a lot of communities. As all of these other socioeconomic conditions and inequalities are recognized, um, you know, the, the, the solution or the response on the part of authorities is always to invest in more police. So I think we know and we knew then that, that that's not a winning solution, that actually if we want to get at the root causes of these problems, we've got to invest in all of the the uh, socioeconomic inequalities um, that create the cocktail of violence in the first place. So that was a sufficient answer for your question, Professor Davenport. Yeah, I mean, that just leaves another question, right? So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you want to ask <laughs> So. Part of the issue, um, so there's a book about um, uh, the failure of nonviolence, but it's got Gogo who talks about this whole issue of how nonviolence protects the state and how we have whole literatures and schools and initiatives that help facilitate that particular component. There's no similar kind of body of work or anything like that that's cultivated on the type of form of resistance and rebellion that you're discussing. And then we have this kind of Rightening or purging of intellectuals such as ourselves. So, we have very few theorists of rioting or rebellion and so forth that are still like remaining, right? And so, um, we end up with this weird articulation of nothing regarding the kind of like what this thing could do or how it could be done or how it could evolve. Distinct from the people who are actually engaging in this behavior will continue to rely upon this repertoire because it is what is most accessible. And in a sense, it is the clearest form of articulation with regards to their, their problems. So mm -hmm. there's this juncture between those of us that are here um, theorizing about stuff, talking about stuff, and the folks that are doing it. And that disjuncture leads to things like Occupy, if this are statements from BLM organizations that are just like, what? 
compared to the four neuron statement, for example. Mm -hmm. So it's just like there's this so there's a disjuncture sometimes I'm trying to figure out exactly where it is, but you catch the behavior, but I'm just like there's this other part of it where the theorists and the other folks are putting together the practices in the ways that can then be kind of transported to different locations. And I'm just like, I'm not seeing where that is. But I don't know what the what do you think the answer to that question is? I think there's this trajectory of like thought and scholarship. And I mean, like, so we end up with a bunch of folks that um, the self-defense stuff goes mm -hmm. far left and kind of black nationalist and then isolated. They're very different from King, but we're still celebrating the King stuff, but we don't go in that next realm of, okay, who are the theorists of self-defense? Okay, those folks go back to the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. We pay much less attention to them. Right. Right. And then some of them end up in Jackson, Mississippi, right? right. And then things don't go well, but they end up institutionalizing mm -hmm. what that vision was of mm -hmm. what black education, mm -hmm. black social power, both the black economics looks like. But we ain't talking about that. And so mm -hmm. it's this, this weird kind of element of the conversations we're still having. I mean, this is why I love what you did with the material. It's just like, you're raising these questions and these issues about which kind of reveal the thing that we're not talking about. And okay, so why are we still here? Okay, get equality, how do we get there? Mm -hmm. What's the resolution to it? You know, people talking like they're talking like Marx, but they're not talking beyond capital, which mm -hmm. is just like, you know, a lot of this stuff is kind of like dated of the models, right? It's like, okay, this this came out of a conception of industrialization. Okay, so after deindustrialization, are jobs gonna fix your problem? Right, right. So it's you know that that kind of dynamic, but yeah. I mean, I think I, I, I think job, I think even though we are deindustrialized, I think jobs are <laughs> jobs can fix our can can help fix the problem. I think you know things like like the current version of guaranteed minimum income, et cetera. So you know, here I, I think part of it is, and I'll just like plug my discipline, um, is the importance of history, um, and the importance of recognizing like like that 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 advocacy for self defense. Um, I don't see it as something that necessarily is radical and in, in fringe. In a lot of ways, again, it's been a necessary strategy for survival um, that uh, Black people in, you know, in the South and all over um, use. I think, you know, in part what you're talking about in terms of like the lat like BLM's, um, some of the elements of their statements or work that might be misguided, I think in part is in uh, a misinterpretation of the civil rights movement and civil rights strategies, misinterpretation, especially of like the politics of respectability. Um, so, you know, I think part of the solution is, is actually thinking about our history in new ways and trying to learn um, uh, the, the, the tactics and strategies that failed. I think, you know, everybody should read W.E.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction. That's the um, that that's the starting point. I think the literature on this, though, on violent protests is, um, you know, while it's still small, I think it's um, I think there are promising new directions. Like um, Benjamin uh, Case's new work, uh, his book Street Rebellion just came out um, in the fall of last year, and he's done like domestic and international quantitative studies on violent protests and basically, you know, pushes back on a lot of the interpretations that um, that argue that um, that that this form of protest, you know, alienates people that it's um, that it's 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 harmful It ends up you know, harming these causes much more to say, like, well, actually, um, you know, what happened in Ferguson helped to mobilize black voters. And in some ways, um, this form of protest uh, helps uh, enfranchise people and create a more robust um, uh, democracy. So I, I'm, I'm excited to see, um, I think in the aftermath of 2020, as more of these issues are being taken up by scholars, you know, where the thinking, where our questioning, um, our answers to some of those questions move. Thank you, Professor Hinton. Um, this was a fascinating talk. I look forward to reading your book. Um, the presentation really made me reflect on, you know, how we define violence um, and what that looks like in different contexts. And the example of 2020, um, Black Lives Matter protests, a lot of the protests that were characterized as violent mostly resulted in like property damage as opposed to like managing of a human being. And so I'm just wondering how you think about the way violence is defined, you know, escalated um, depending on the 
what is being, like what the violence is being done to, whether it's people or property, and if that matters at all for you and your work. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think um, one of the things that I point out in the book is that, uh, you know, like, as you say, the real, uh, the most kind of violent actions in 2020 were they are, or kind of like, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're against uh, monuments, we're against like Confederate monuments, monuments arguing or um, honoring um, people like Christopher Columbus and um, conquistadors. That's where we actually see the most damage and vandalism. And of course, like the, you know, the politics of that violence are, um, is, is, is very, very clear. Um, I think, you know, the thing, and this gets to the, the point about kind of that I made at the end about um, protesters becoming more peaceful, but the police becoming more violent. The, the, the issue now is that, you know, because of that, with the, the state's monopoly on violence, right? In these moments when police use tear gas or rubber bullets or do mass arrests, the way that it's covered or seen, right, is that like the, that, that the protesters were violent and that the police were responding in kind. Um, and so the way that 2020 was talked about and kind of used politically um, by the right, uh, drew from these depictions or, or, or that imbalance that anytime police use uh, violent means that it's somehow um, justified because people were protesting in a violent, uh, in a violent way. But I think, you know, in terms of like the property damage, I mean, I think that's also through the, in, in the late 60s and 70s, um, property damage was also uh, a major, major part of the violence. I think one of the things that we don't, we haven't really seen since um, LA in 92 is um, people kind of randomly assaulting uh, white people, um, which was more prevalent in the late 60s and 70s and was really, um, you know, occurred in very disturbing ways during the Miami Rebellion in 1980. But I think property damage has been a big part of, of this form of protest. And I think that further um, reflects that, you know, these are about, uh, these are demands for full political and economic inclusion and are about, um, are rooted in feelings of marginalization and also lack of ownership um, of one's home, of businesses in one's community. Um, in the case of 2020, I think, again, the other really interesting thing is that, you know, most of the looting and property damage, you know, did not happen in um, low income communities, but happened in uh, really high end neighborhoods. So in L.A., it was like Rodeo Drive that got in Santa Monica, got that, that got rooted in that Central Ave um, in South L.A., as it did in 92 and 65. Thank you. One more. There's. So, yeah, so, so, um, so, so two things, one was I thought actually reflecting on both of these things, I thought your point that the, they were much more explicit, at least in my recollection, um, uh, political demands and political organization in the, the um, so Ferguson and post Ferguson um, demonstrations and uh, I think is actually a really interesting, a really interesting point. And the question is, do, does that make them more effective? Because that's because we learn hope <laughs> that that, you know, so that makes them more effective. But the other question I kept thinking about is, I just read, um, just by chance, um, Radio Free Dixie, mm -hmm. and oh, yeah, and 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 it really sort of highlights the. Um, I mean, that's not the point of the book, but it's sort of the the celebration of. The um, of nonviolence as kind of the way that we want to understand Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement, and how a very explicit and political and conscious and not not just sort of you know emotionally you know you know violence is is very much part of of uh, the long term history of the African American struggle. And, right. and uh, anyway, I just wanted to know if you sort of what you thought about that and how that fits into your overall yeah. Argument. No, I, 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 I love that. And I think that's, that's really what I'm trying, that, that's one of the big things that I'm trying to do with this work is that I think, you know, that, that part of the problem and what's keep, what keeps the cycle going is that we haven't really taken this violence seriously or this form of protest seriously, or, you know, I mean, it, seem, it, it seems kind of obvious, but it's not that like this was 
And again, the archive is what proved it, that this actually, after Martin Luther King was assassinated, this is what young people, this is the form of protest that young Black people were engaging in. Um, you know, I think that there, I, I am not, I think some, sometimes I get misinterpreted as kind of like celebrating this form of protest, which is, I, I'm not doing that. I'm just trying to actually reckon with what happened and think about how violence and nonviolence has worked together historically to advance social and racial justice and continuing to dismiss uh, violent protests as criminal is only gonna continue to perpetuate these cycles um, and these problems. I think that's such a terrific way to close. And I thank you so much, Professor. Thank Henry. you. And thank you all for, thank you so much. <laughs>